Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to CIS Day. My name is Ayush Patel and I would like to introduce you all to our project, Network Infrastructure Services Utility. So with that said, let's begin with a couple introductions. Myself, Ayush Patel, I'm the team lead on this project. I'm also joined alongside here with my Scrum Master, Ricky Resendez, and my lead developer, Ryan Scott. We worked on the mentorship of Dr. Irene Belova and master student Nathan LeBlanc. And our clients are Nathan Vaughn and Daniel White, who are representing the Naval Undersea Warfare Center Division at Newport, Rhode Island. So with that said, let's dive into the project overview. So the proposed idea behind our project aims to increase workforce efficiency. The program that we developed not only takes care of, but fully automates everyday monotonous tasks that our clients encounter in their workspace. Now, you may be wondering, what are these tasks and how are they monotonous? So, let's get into them. Every single day, our clients need to figure out which devices are online, which devices are offline, which devices are online and are they available to work on? And are they fully equipped with all the tools necessary to get the tasks done for the day? If they're not fully equipped with all the tools necessary to get the tasks done for the day, what software needs to get installed to get the tasks done? So, our program implements an organized way of getting these tasks done by developing services to automate them. You put all these services together and you connect them, we create a utility program. Hence the name, Network Infrastructure Services Utility. Now, in order to truly understand how this project works, we're going to break it down into two major components, the front end and the back end. And we're also going to dive into further details about the subcomponents that make up the front end and the back end. So with that said, now I'm going to pass it off to my lead developer, Ryan Scott, to talk about the back end. Ryan? Right. Hi, I'm Ryan Scott, and I'm going to be uh, taking you guys through our back end. So the first script I'm going to be talking about is our network scanner. So the network scanner uh, utilizes the package uh, SCAPI. Uh, to scan a local server network. Uh, we use the function rping, which does rpu as requests uh, to determine if a computer is online or not. Uh, to do this, we use the default gateway IP address uh, that allows us to scan and find all available devices on the network. Uh, once we found all the devices on a network, uh, we're gonna dump this into a TXT, uh, which is gonna be converted uh, by our next uh, script, the data conversion script. So this script uh, is basically responsible for converting all of that information that we just got from the network scanner uh, into a JSON format. Uh, so this script goes uh, line by line, and each new line in the TXT uh, contains a computer, and each computer contains its MAC address and its IP address. Uh, once we've moved every computer uh, into uh, a Python dictionary, we're going to dump that Python dictionary uh, into a JSON since uh, Python dictionaries are JSON literals. And now I'm going to give you guys an inside look into how we set up our JSON uh, file. So the way we set it up is we have uh, the servers and then their associated devices. And we broke the devices up into uh, two sections, uh, the master section and the repeat section. Uh, the master section basically contains all of the core devices, the devices that regularly show up uh, on a network scan. And then repeat contains all the devices that are found on the most recent scan. So repeat uh, devices are always going to be updating based off of the network scan that's uh, been recently done. And now I'm going to go into our online detection script. So our online detection script is responsible for basically determining if the device uh, in the master section uh, or in the server is online or not. Uh, so basically what we do is we open up the server.json uh, file that I just explained and we uh, iterate through the master section and the repeat section and compare the devices uh, in these sections uh, to determine if the device is online or not. Uh, if a device in the master section uh, is in the repeat section, then that device is considered online. Uh, if the device is uh, not found in the master section uh, and not found in the repeat section, then that device is considered offline. Uh, if the device is not found in the master section but is found in the repeat section, then that device is considered new and appended into the master section to be later viewable on the front end and for future comparisons. Now I'm going to go into one of our smaller scripts, uh, package installer. 
Uh, so the package installer is, as its name is, it's responsible for installing certain packages uh, that we use uh, for our program. And uh, the reason why uh, we use this is to make sure that all of our scripts run without error. Now, the package uh, installer calls a subprocess, which in turn calls a PIP, Python's package manager. Uh, and it will install uh, the Python uh, packages onto the user's machine. Uh, and this will get utilized by the mother script, nadt.sh. Uh, this is uh, in control of all of those scripts that I just previously discussed. Uh, it will basically determine if the virtual environment is installed on the user's machine or enabled. Uh, it will determine if all the packages necessary for these scripts are available to run, and then it will execute these scripts uh, in order. Uh, so the first thing that the script does is it checks to see if a virtual environment is set up uh, on the user's machine. Uh, if it's not, the package installer will get called and it will install uh, virtual EMB. The reason why we're using virtual EMB uh, is to basically make sure that if there are possible Python version conflicts, whether it be with Python itself or uh, the scripts, uh, we don't want that to happen because we don't know what type of packages and libraries they use on their computers. Uh, once we set up the virtual environment, uh, we are going to determine if other packages are installed on the user's machine. Uh, if they aren't, package start gets called and installs them. Uh, but once everything is set up, uh, all the packages and libraries that these uh, scripts use are uh, on the user's machine. Uh, the bash script is going to execute all those Python scripts in order. Uh, and that ends uh, the bash script uh, section in the network architecture diagram tool. And now on to uh, deployment, uh, which is the next section of our project. So deployment, uh, it basically connects, it creates a connection between the uh, host machine and the remote machine. Uh, and instead of having to move files uh, through a flash drive, basically putting a, a files onto a flash drive on a computer and then moving that flash drive to the other computer, uh, we can just do this remotely through a wired connection. Uh, so uh, to do this, uh, we have um, SSH, uh, which create, creates that connection uh, between the host machine and the remote machine. So I'm going to go into the package manager, which handles uh, the tarring of files and the packages uh, and deployment, and then I'm going to go into SSH, uh, which creates the connection. So uh, for package manager, uh, this allows us to be able to unpack uh, certain packages or compress files into a tar.gz. Uh, and then obviously you can be able to deploy these files that you were uh, uh, just messing around with in the package manager uh, to the remote machine. And then uh, for the SSH connection, uh, this is uh, done by using a package called Paramito. Uh, it allows us to log into the user's uh, machine with a password, uh, username and password. Uh, once that connection is established, uh, it's going to create an SSH key. Uh, this SSH key is going to be used uh, for future deployment uh, reasons uh, to ensure that when the user uh, wants to deploy files to this computer again, they're not going to have to enter in their password um, ever again. And that concludes the back end portion of our project. And now I'm Tayush to carry on about the front end. Thank you, Ryan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's dive into further details about the front end. When it comes to the front end, the option that fared in these the best was React. More specifically, React.js. And the front end is broken down into four components box, container, model, and index. So, let's start from the top. Now, box.js. Box.js, uh, it uses a set of React utilities called React DND. What React DND does, it helps a developer build very complex drag and drop interfaces. What you see on the screen is not that very complex, of course. It's a very basic movement where I'm swapping a device that was offline on the right in place of a device that was online. Additionally, it is also responsible for modifying the color scheme that you see here. The devices that are online have a green background, and the devices that are offline have a gray background. Moving on, we have container.js. Now, container.js is responsible for setting up um, containers on the web page to house every single device that was last scanned on the network, and it organizes it into a neatly fashion. It is also a very crucial script, since it references the JSON file that was produced by the backend, as Ryan talked about earlier. That JSON file holds device information about every single device that was last scanned. Moving on, 
Now, what you see on the screen is a pop-up dialog box, or in React terminology, it is referred to as a modal. When a user clicks on a computer, a modal pops up. It all displays all the attributes of that device. As you can see here, the IP address, the MAC address, and the status, which appears in this instance, the device is online. Moving on, to tie it all together, we need a script that will host the application to be displayed in the web browser. So, we have index.js. Box, container, modal, they all rely on index.js, and we put it all together, that creates our front end. Now, I'm gonna move into the methods and tools that we utilize uh, during the development process. Starting off with the back end. First of all, we use Bash script for automation. We also use Python because it works best when it came to integrating with React. Um, when it comes to the environment, we used PyCharm and VS Code. Now, let's move on to the front end. As I mentioned earlier, it uses React. We also use HTML5 and combine that with CSS. For client communication, we use Microsoft Teams. For source control and keeping track of the older versions of the project, we use Bitbucket. When it comes to internal team communication, we use Slack. We also use Slack to keep track of our resources around the entire project. With that said, let's move on to the demos. Now, given the complexity of how the school network is set up, it is really not possible to do a live demonstration, so we have pre-recorded our demos. We have also broken down the demos into three different sections, front end, SSHing, and deployment to gain a better understanding of each. So with that said, let's get into the front end demo. So, what you see on the screen is, apologize, it's kind of hard to see with the glare being here. This is the master.json file that was produced by the back end. Uh, as you can see, it's displaying all the device information from the last scan, the MAC address, the IP address, and the status. You can see some devices are online, some devices are offline. And we start the front end. And that is our user interface. As you can see here, when you click on a device, the model pops up. And in this instance, the device happens to be online, so it displays all the device details, the IP address, the MAC address, and the status. Um, Oops, the status is online. So we close out of that. Now we click on a device that is offline. Same thing goes for the medal. The IP address is shown. Thank you, Boba. The IP address is shown. Uh, the MAC address is shown. And the status is showed off as offline. Close out of that. Now, this is not how an actual lab is usually set up. In actual lab, computers are moved around. In real life, computers are moved around, so our clients want to be able to do that. They want to be able to mimic how their lab is set up. So they can simply do so by dragging and dropping devices. They can organize it however they want, and they can do so just like that. So that concludes the front end portion of the demo. Now I'm going to pass it off to Ryan to talk about the back ends of the demo. Ryan? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go into the uh, SSH demo. Uh, so for the SSH demo, uh, we've already we created a program that basically logs us in. Uh, we're going to create the SSH keys. Um, so we're going to establish the connection between the host machine uh, and the remote machine. Uh, so currently the program is uh, trying to generate the SSH key uh, image. Uh, that it's going to be placed on the host machine and the remote machine. So you'll see uh, in about a second uh, on the host machine, you'll see the keys. So we've got the keys there. And then uh, in a few seconds, you're going to see on the VM uh, that there's going to be uh, the keys there too. So that uh, concludes the SSH demo, uh, creating the connection. And now I'm going to move on to uh, deployment. Okay. So for deployment, uh, this is the uh, remote machine. It does not have a tar file, and then the host machine does have a tar file. Uh, we're going to move that uh, file uh, from the host machine to the remote machine since we've established the SSH keys. Uh, it's as easy as just literally pressing the deploy, 
So now you'll see on the host machine and the remote machine, now the tar file uh, has been copied over. And that concludes uh, the back end uh, demos and uh, Brian, you to carry on. Ladies and gentlemen, with that said, we cover the front end and we cover the back end. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, I would like to also open up the floor to any questions that anybody has. Yes, of course. Just wanted to understand the scope of your work. <clears throat> is this entirely focused on local area networks, or uh, does it also cover systems of systems where there might be a wide area network? Um, it's more of a like a private network that they have on base for all the computers in their lab, it's and it's offline. Yeah. Ah, okay, thank you. So you said that this was a, the client was a Naples base in Rhode Island, you said? Yes, Naples Undersea Warfare Center Division in Newport, Rhode Island to be exact. Alright, so when you were working on this, I just, this isn't necessarily entirely related, but how was it, was it like stressful working on this project, knowing what the client was like? Um, our clients, we were fortunately very blessed with our clients, they were very understanding. Um, they are, both Nate and Dan, they have been through the process of working through Capstone, working with Dr. Irene Belova. So they definitely understood when it comes to time constraints and um, when it comes to your question about it being stressful. Uh, it's stressful in the sense uh, that when you're trying to learn something that you haven't done before, I, I guess that's when it can get stressful. But when it comes to like requirements set by the clients and stuff like that, like they were just so understanding about what like what like we might know and what we might not know, and that it was going to take us time to get here. And uh, that I guess that if that answers your question, or more of like it was a stress of just trying to figure out how everything works and how everything fits together. So, right, yeah. Not to mention the number of assignments I make. <laughs> Any other questions? Going once. So I noticed there's basically three data elements that you're getting from each device. If you had had more time, would the client have been interested in any other um, data getting, getting from the devices, such as you know, just usage or anything? Do they they talk about how you would expand expand this product? Yeah. Um, Definitely, when it comes to, um, like Ryan mentioned earlier, like uh, we definitely did not have any background knowledge of networking when it comes to this. So this is, we learned everything from scratch. But for when it comes to like more expanding this project, absolutely. Um, like the, the main thing that the clients like, in the future when it comes to expansion, um, the main thing is if they want to add a device, correct? they want to be able to add a device, they can basically implement a functionality or implement the feature where they can just be like, oh, add new device, instead of, you know, just scanning devices. They can manually enter devices. But, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, there are many ways, uh, different directions, I feel like this is project could like really uh, be taken. Uh, for example, like say we have a VM that's nested inside of, uh, of a computer, maybe there would be a way of detecting that and fitting it to that computer so that you know which VM belongs to which computer. So I guess that's one of the things that we could expand upon. Uh, software curing, which allows us to find out what packages are installed on the user's machine. Uh, so like this, it's just, there, there's so many like things that this uh, this product could be expanded upon, and I think that's what's so great about it. Yeah, so. Uh, this has been a great start of CIS Day, so thank you, Ayush and team.